Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, I want to talk about the Hake brush. I've had a few questions, uh, comments in the um, YouTube comment section. I had somebody on my Patreon ask about the Hake brush. So I wanted to kind of explore it in detail and um, see what type of issues I can address with it. Now, first and foremost, this is the Hake brush I use. This is a medium Ron Ranson Hake brush. Uh, I got it from Cheap Joe Art Stuff. I think uh, Cheap Joe's Art Supply brands it with that name after it. Uh, Pro Art makes the brush itself, I believe, but it doesn't say that anywhere on here. Anyway, I've had this one for about three years. I'm gonna show you one that is in the packaging. And you can see how much of a difference that is. Seeing that side by side uh, really brought to life to me how different and how used my Hake brush is. So uh, I figured one of the things that might be helpful is to use a brand new one as opposed to my age old one, just in case there's any, I guess, special properties that this one has obtained over the years, you know, just the roughness of the bristles, the uh, misalignment of it. You know, this guy's been through a lot. So let's uh, put this one on the side. I'll be honest, it feels a little weird <laughs> doing that. I've been using it for so long. So here's one uh, straight from it. With these brushes and with um, Chinese brushes, by the way, the correct pronunciation, I believe, is hake for the brush. But um, and I think hake or hake means brush in general. So we'll just call it brush. Um, it's They're usually pre-starched to give you that shape. Here is another brand. And in a previous video, we played around with this one, trying to get a rougher texture with it. But these Ron Ranson hake brushes are nice and pre-worn. So warm water or water in general will help loosen it up and get that starch off of there. And I'm just gonna kind of be rough with it. I know usually you kind of want to baby your brushes and take care of them. And I clean them after every session that I use them. But my personal philosophy is, is that if you look at a brush, you have a certain price point for the brush. It's lasted for this long. You know, you know I'm getting my use out of it. Like maybe what, $10, $15? eight fifteen dollars I haven't priced them out in a while anyway that being said if you baby the brush with the painting process you're going to uh, I don't know maybe not get the full effect the full influence of it so these brushes do shed and what I'm doing is kind of just wetting it and scrubbing it out and pulling any loose hairs that are there. And that should be good enough. Now, when I was thinking about what to address in this video, I feel like you can't address a brush without addressing paper. I use the Stonehenge Aqua paper, the 100% cotton. And this is all cold press. These are all the backs of paintings. And we're going to use this for our examples. So the first thing that I thought about was how I paint wet and wet. And what that means is I saturate the paper with water and then I feed color into it with my hake brush. I use a large hake brush to do those large water applications. And I really like this because it gives a nice diffused effect. In a bit, I'll talk about how we can partially wet the paper and then we'll see how it looks on um, dry paper. So what I'm essentially saying is, is that the surface that I'm interacting with is going to influence the way the brush works. 
if you've oil painted and you tried painting on top of wet oil, you start noticing that there's a huge difference than just painting straight onto the canvas. Okay, so this guy is nice and wet. Then what I was thinking about were the pigments themselves. That I'll use kind of a combination of pigments in uh, different states of wetness. Some, and hopefully this is showing on the camera, let me check. Yeah, let me shift this over a little bit. We'll make sure this guy's up here. I'll take a hake brush, and right now it's very saturated. I dipped it, I made sure it's soaked with water. And I might put a pile of water on my pan. I'm just brushing off some raw sienna. And I could change my concentration in this. I could add more water if I want to. This is going to create a very light wash. Now, I'll pull more pigment off. Since I have so much water on here, I could really start getting that raw sienna wet, almost as if I had sprayed it with a bottle of water. And you'll see how different that is. And that's usually the main stroke that I do, especially when I'm painting wet and wet. Now, there are other type of marks and movements that you could make if we wanted to start creating in this fashion. I could feel that this brush reacts differently than my worn one. I'm looking to see if there's any difference in the length of the hairs. This personally feels like there is. There's definitely a different springiness to it. Same brand, just aged worn. Okay. Now, the other thing is if we have something straight from the tube and how that's going to affect it as well. Now, you know you uh, paint way too much. Whenever you start getting blisters on your hand, <laughs> where do you open up the tube? Okay, so let's grab straight from the tube and we'll feed that in just so you can see how that is. So simply by changing, using wet and wet, we saturated our brush completely, we put down a wet wash, we then wet our dried paint even more and put down a wash, we dappled it in, then we pulled paint that was straight from the tube and played with it there. So that's what I think of with the wet and wet phase. Uh, one thing that I do want to add is this. Whenever you're wet and wet, with the hake brush, with water concentration, if I grab more water and I have a now wet wash and I paint into those, I start getting the cauliflower effect. I start moving around what's already there. In fact, you could see me moving it and trying to emphasize it, but it's a very obvious thing that happens. So what I recommend doing with the hake brush is using that initial amount of water, using a little bit of water to wet the paints on the palette, but don't dip as much as you go through the stages. Keep in mind, as you progress in this stage, more pigment, less water. If you ever want to pull water out of the hake brush, you could squeeze right around there. You see how much I just pulled out? I'll probably pull out even more. Yeah. And that's just pulling from the base here. So that's uh, controlling the water on the hake brush in the wet and wet stage and some of the brush marks that we can get. Let's uh, say goodbye to this guy. What was this on the back of? Let's see. Big reveal. I don't want to get paints everywhere. Okay, I remember this one. 
it's always fun um, looking back at paintings and thinking about what went through your mind whenever you were doing it. So let's switch gears and we have a new back of a painting. And we'll do a technique that I've seen uh, with David Usher and Alan Owen, the way they will kind of prep a paper, a uh, painting. They'll kind of, I do a saturation phase where I'm super wet, like uh, Stephen Cronin does that a lot. Excuse me. Here I'm gonna take the heat brush and feed in some water. Kind of dance around the page and not paint in completely. So Alan Owen and uh, David Usher are uh, two people that come to mind when I think of that approach for fast and loose. So I'm going to saturate my uh, hake brush. Now this isn't a technique that I usually use. I have explored it in the beginning. You find what works for you. And let's paint over that. We'll start seeing some dry brush areas and skipping areas taking place. So like I said before, starting surface will affect the, the painting just as much as the brush. Uh, here we had partially wet throughout and we started getting that interesting effect. Um, a beautiful way to paint you could really get some amazing results that are fast and loose. But with fast and loose, it does require practice and, um, you know, finding your flow. So I'm out of my element with this a little bit, but I will just demonstrate some of the different marks and the feeds that you can get with this. This is a stronger pigment. This brush has just a nice sharp edge to it. Look at that beautiful straight line you can make. When I go through the wet areas, it diffuses. But holy cow, a fresh hake brush, Ron Ranson hake brush, will do some nice fine lines. Golly. Let's see if I can, here's my, my mine, my used one. How long that pointed edge stays for, I have no idea. Okay. Let's see, okay, so this is the old one. It's there, it has more character to it <laughs> than um, the, uh, the fresh one. So you could definitely see that as you use the brush or abuse the brush, you will um, you'll change the mark making ability that it can make. Even this, if I was to dapple or stipple with it, see how it bunches together compared to this guy. You can probably see how this one was more grouped together. Let's see if there's anything we can do to make them a scary brush. It's a, a term that I read in a watercolor book once that the painter always had his, a scary brush. Yeah, so if you kind of really pull a lot of pigment out, and, uh, sorry, water out, you have a light mix. We got hair everywhere. This guy's sheds, it's brand new. We pull him out, make him crazy. A little mix with the water and the pigment. We can get the scarier effect, the, the bigger one. So until the hake gets to where you want, use them all frazzled. Trying to frazzle me, he doesn't want to. And then from there, water pigment mix. You can 
So you can spline it like that to get that. And I think that's a big effect that uh, somebody on the Patreon had asked about was how they were was able to get that. So uh, once again, this is kind of like damp and I had a, more of a watery mix that I was just pulling into. By the way, whenever I get to a point, if I need to add more water, if I was at the tree phase, I would take just the edge and put just the edge in. And that gives me more than enough water. Just the edge. And I could put it there to reconstitute more than enough water. Now, let's switch this guy out and we'll see just pure dry paper. And then from there, we have um, water on the brush to look at. Uh, sorry, pigments on the brush to look at. And I'll explain once I get to that stage. What was this one on the back of? Let's see, big reveal. Ooh, this is looking on the Vermilion River. There's this old uh, tall Victorian white house that I was putting in there. And I was playing with razor blade scraping. Must have been a burnt umber, burnt sienna, ultramarine painting, splattering. I think I was just experimenting. Very cool. All right. This guy is going to be completely dry, and we'll look and see how the hake brush in the various stages of wet deal with that. Okay, so I'm going to pull water, very wet mix. Uh, we've been using raw sienna as our example, so we'll just continue with that. And there's our wash right there. Kind of similar to um, the slightly wet throughout one that I had demonstrated earlier. I used to have a paper towel that I would dip on and dry on, but I, I just keep a towel in my hand. Let's pull a lot of pigment up. We're using some raw sienna today, aren't we? There you go. More pigment, less water. We'll get more of a dry brush effect. And personally, if you watch a lot of my painting videos, you'll see that I do the wet and wet phase for the softness, and then I'll go to this phase for um, the contrast on top of it. Let's try to tree texture. Uh, having to adapt to this brush, definitely different than how I would usually um, use a tree, paint a tree with it. So this guy, more frazzled. I think it's just a matter of it being worn in. You could sit here. You might have to, uh, I don't know. Sacrifice a brush to get that texture. Some people will take scissors to old brushes and cut crazy um, edges to them. Actually, we're, we're getting close to it. So using that technique earlier. Yeah. In fact, the newer one might have more versatility. Okay. So there's that on a dry paper and we'll do the big reveal see what was on the back of Let's see. I remember this one but I don't remember what was influencing it and this point must be important and the S-shaped composition here. I don't know if I was looking at a photograph or what. Anywho. This is a question that I had asked David Usher 
about three years ago when I first started painting watercolor. Um, and I think it's something that Stuart Davies in his oil paintings has talked about and um, other painters will talk about. Whenever using multiple pigments, I was, I was wondering about like loading the brush with pigment. So my question was, is like, how do you load the brush? Like, what are you doing? We're gonna use raw sienna, raw sienna, and some Payne's Gray. And if I play around on it, get some more raw sienna. I now have a mixture of those two colors on it. And just that variety there alone gives us a way more interesting feel than if we had just taken raw sienna or sorry, Payne's Gray. So by loading paint onto it, grab some burnt sienna. We'll even grab try to grab some ultramarine when it's dry. We'll see if we can get all those different colors on there. By simply doing that, you get beautiful effects. And that's something to keep in mind and to play around with. Um, I've started showing in my painting videos how I barely wash the brush off. Either I'm exhausting the pigment on it or I'm just letting it start mixing together. To me, it gives a more natural feel. Watercolor, and there's different approaches to art. There's no correct thing or not. But with watercolor, I think high key, very bright colors, very impressionist is very popular. I usually paint um, darker and moodier. Um, the, and that's because I subscribe to a school of thought um, of painting with, called tonalism, where there's kind of a, a color uniformity throughout and that blending that takes place. Um, and plus, I like the paintings from the 1800s that are probably negatively affected by the progression of time where um, the colors have faded and they're a little bit darker and all that. But the same concept, it will apply to the Asian arts, to the Oriental arts, where you take a brush and I'll try two different colors. You'll, they'll load a brush with a color. And I'm just trying to grab some alizarin crimson on it. So they'll load one color and you can get multiple colors on it and put a different color on the end. And you can see we get multiple colors in that one brush stroke and it just makes things interesting. And I think just that carries over to the hake for me, where we could have multiple colors for one brush stroke. Look at those dry brush effects. So I, this was pretty, uh, hopefully an exhaustive approach to the, um, the hake brush. Uh, and to kind of recap, and also, uh, if you like this, let me know. If I didn't address something, please let me know in the comments. It's probably a long video, I apologize for that. Um, also, please like, subscribe, comment, and um, please consider supporting me on Patreon, all that other stuff. I just want to get all that out of the way. But just to recap, the material that you're painting on is very important. In fact, people will probably say paper is the most important thing that you're working with. Um, here, 100% cotton. Stonehenge Aqua, one of these sheet sizes cost me about a dollar. Once I, I buy it large, I break it into these sizes. I'm doing about a dollar on each one of these. Um, Fabriano Studio is an alternative that's 25% cotton that they sell in packs of 50. That might be $25, $30. You have to do the math and see what works out. 
leave a comment below if you want me to do the math and I'll do that. I'm a math teacher by trade, but I've been doing math all day. So the surface can affect it. And not just the material that the surface is made out of, but if you're painting wet and wet, uh, if you're painting uh, semi-wet, if you're painting dry brushing, okay? We looked at water concentration, how to control that, and how that affected uh, back runs. We saw that in the wet and wet one. We saw how to pull water out of the hay brush, right there. We saw how to get the dappled effect, the uh, stippled effect, by scaring up the brush and grabbing some pigment. I don't really have much water in that, so let me grab a little bit from the edge. Pull my water out, and then dapple some. There we go. We saw different ways to wet the palette with the Hake brush. We saw a different color loading on it, and we did compare it to a well-worn Hake brush uh, from the same maker. He was about the same person. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed. I found, hope you found that interesting, and I will talk to you all soon. You all have a great day.